Welcome back to Beautiful Work, Beautiful Life. Well, we are steeped in the holiday season now, folks. So I hope that you have a few minutes today for a really important topic, because oftentimes we are uh, encountering this, especially this time of year, but we often don't know what to do when we are there, and we don't think we have time for it, but we uh, hopefully are going to speak into this a little bit today and help you change your mind and give you some, some insight. So our topic for today is how to welcome grief. And Laurel and I are so, so happy to welcome a new guest to the podcast today. And I just want to say that the Instagram angels were at work once again in my life, bringing Sue into my vision and into my space. And as soon as I connected with her on Instagram and started reading what she was posting, I was um, an immediate fan, let's say. So, uh, Sue, I am so happy to welcome you to the podcast today. Everybody, I want to introduce you to Sue Burrow. Hello, Sue. Hi, Hello, ladies. Sue. Hi, listeners. I am so excited to be here. Yeah. So excited. Laurel, Laurel, can you even believe that we're actually now here doing this? We talked about it and we we're like, oh, yes, yes, yes. Let's get Sue to come. And she's here and we're so happy. Yeah. Yes. I am so happy to be with you, Sue. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm super excited. Yeah. Let's, yeah. let's, let's talk about grief. <laughs> let's talk about grief. So, uh, you know, um, did anyone else we... hear? Did anyone else hear that song in Salt and Pepper song? Let's talk about. Grief, grief baby. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, let's talk about grief baby. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about grief baby. It's oftentimes, uh, I know in our culture, that the thing people don't want to talk about or, and don't know how to talk about. Mm -hmm. Don't you think? I mean, that's one of the biggest things is who gets, where do you get the skills to talk about grief if you're not listening to our, our podcast today? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Sue, I'm really glad that you're out there beginning to... Uh, make it more normal and more mainstream to talk about some of these things. And I know with the holidays, it can be one of the trickiest times. So um, I hope this helps some people that might be struggling right now during the holiday season and uh, certainly going forward, coming back and listening to the podcast as many times as you need to, to, to get the information in there. So Sue, you want to tell us a little bit about how you ended up becoming a, a grief counselor coach? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, it's a calling at this point. Um, so I, I got married in 1988 <laughs> and very happily married for a long time. And I was met, I was originally in the medical field, switched over to the holistic side and became a massage therapist. And through that, um, eight years ago, my husband died. And through that, I, I continued and I became a life coach. And as, as I was life coaching, I saw that everybody was really talking about grief. And having gone through my own grief journey, I decided to become a grief educator and a grief coach. And, you know, just having these conversations. When we talk about grief, we're really having conversations about love. And that's... You know, people have asked me, how can you do this? How can you talk about this all the time? And it's not heavy for me. It's it's really conversations of love. And people are walking this journey, and I don't want them to be alone because I, know, I remember how lonely and scared that was. And grief is so misunderstood. And I'm here to help people understand and take the stigma away from grief that we don't. We don't get over this, and that's okay. We don't want to get over our person or our people or our pets. Right. We don't want to get rid of the love, right? No, I mean, as don't. you say, right? right? <laughs> that, that, that the love never goes away. And it's, mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the pain of the loss begins to uh, shift over time, but the love is always there. I love that it's you just put it there. in that context, right? The so love beautiful. is always there. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. The, the grief changes and morphs and it comes back and it, it goes away. And, you know, it, it comes up in what I call grief bubbles or mm. it's sneaky. Like yeah. grief is, a, I, sometimes I say grief is a sneaky bitch because it can just, <laughs> it, it can just come out of nowhere sometimes. I know. I know. It feels like a grief attack sometimes, doesn't it? Yes, when it comes out of attack. nowhere, it's like, what? what? 
wait a minute, I thought it was over this. Or yeah, didn't even see that coming. Yeah. Yeah. And something that could have happened so long ago too. You Mm -hmm. know, it's such a journey, right? This idea of it being like a linear thing that you go through these stages and it's done is um, pretty much a myth, really. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, when we were talking before, and I had mentioned the five stages, and now there are six stages, and the six stages from David Kessler, and that is finding meaning. And even that stage is being um, people are like I can't find meaning in his in the death, and he's not talking about that. He is saying finding meaning in life, finding meaning in their life. Yeah, and yeah. so my husband, I'm finding meaning by talking about um, and volunteering, doing, having conversations with people that have lost people to suicide, because that is how my husband died. <clears throat> so finding meaning that way, finding a greater purpose that way, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah. And just to touch upon those five, those five stages, those were originally written for people that were diagnosed to die with cancer or, or something like that. And over the years, they have died, been morphed into the stages of of grief, which they certainly can be. We can go through those stages, not in any particular or, order. Like you said, they're not linear. We bounce back and forth. We can even skip stages. Right. But, right. you know, the number one thing that people need in grief is to be witnessed and to yes. be heard. Yes, and yes. there's so much that, you know, there are people are there for that first month and then they disappear. Yeah. Right. And right. we are sitting in our pain by ourselves. We are wondering, when am I going to get over this? Should I be over this? And there's just so much misunderstanding that grieving people are often in their pain. And now on top of it, they're trying to figure out something that they have no experience doing. They don't know where to get the resources. And often they're trying to teach the people that are trying to support them what they need when they don't even know themselves. So it's just a big old mess. It is. It is. So one of the things that we'll do in the podcast today is make sure that we have all your contact information in the show notes. So if people need a resource, they can certainly reach out to you. I know here in Richmond, um, we have a really beautiful um, organization called the Full Circle Grief Center, and they do a lot of groups and um, one-to-one counseling. It's a really beautiful resource here. And um, so I'll put that one, I know, in the show notes, because I just happen to to be connected with them and can put that information here. Mm -hmm. But I think it is such a journey to find the right kind of support. I think one of the things um, that I talk a lot about, you know, in in coaching with clients when we're talking about loss and grief and, and supporting others is even just the beginning, you know, for me, like one of the hardest things for me personally to experience, right. Is, is having people tell you, um, uh, the things that are inappropriate at the beginning when you have a loss, like, um, uh, you'll feel better soon or you know I can't remember I mean there's so many things that people say that are just so like not helpful and I feel like some of our educating is is just to even tell people how to what's what's a good what's a supportive way to respond to somebody when you when you meet somebody and they're going through a loss how do we support how do we offer even just on the street support right (laughs) I yeah to validate is one thing you know we don't want to do anything with a but a but they're in a better place you know because we've we've validated them we've just taken it away right in the same sentence you know i am you know just saying i am so sorry for your loss yeah yeah end of story right there i know we don't have to say more, right? Saying more right. oftentimes is the part that gets it hard, right? Mm-hmm. I'm yeah. just so how, sorry. How are you? How are you doing? Do you need to talk? I mean, right? These right. Things, and, right. And even yeah. that, even that, um, you know, often when early in my grief, people would say, "How are you?" The question, "How are you?" is yeah. enormous to a person that's grieving. Yeah. A better question is, "How are you today?" Today narrows it down to like, oh, today? Oh, I can figure that out. Yeah. Today's a hard day or today's, I'm okay today, right? I'm getting through today, right? Like people can answer that question. 
Right. Yeah, how are you this hour? Yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> sometimes it's by hour, sometimes it's yeah. minute by minute. But how yeah. are you is just too enormous. I know, I know, right? And and I think that um, if you if you if you can't really offer true like help or support or you know call if you want to talk or any of those kinds of things it's like it's okay just to say oh my gosh i am so sorry for your loss i mean and leave it at that like it's mm-hmm. a, oftentimes i think that's one of the things in our culture people want to talk a lot and so it's okay to just stop there and right yeah well the yeah. other thing that people do is if you need anything call me and that's now putting the burden on the person that's grieving yeah. so now I have to think of something that I need and I'm going to call you. That's way too much. Yeah. Right. If you really want to help, you come over with groceries and you put them on the front step, ring the doorbell or something like that. Yeah. You come over and you mow the grass or you send a text, I'm going to bring your barrels out. Yeah. Those kind of things are so helpful. Yeah, we great. can't, you know, in the case of mine, mine was so, it was so traumatic I couldn't think of what I needed. And when groceries showed up at my door or I saw that my driveway was plowed, I I was just so grateful. I I couldn't even tell you what I needed. Yeah, right, right. If you really want to help, you just do things. Yeah, yeah. One of of the things I think about um, is that grief comes in um, not just in response or as an emotion tied to death or a loss but you know there are other things in life that we grieve and Mm -hmm. one of my questions often is what do you you know what how do you help those people who don't even know what it is they're feeling they don't recognize it as grief right it might be I, I don't I don't feel well I'm I'm sad or and but without even understanding that it is maybe it's a past grief Mm -hmm. um that shows up so i you know what might you say to our listeners who know they're not feeling themselves but haven't quite identified what is causing them to feel this what we know is grief yeah well that's i'm so glad you brought that up because grief seems to be a word say for when a person or a pet maybe has died where grief is any loss. So in something like that, and I had a client once that was going through a breakup and he was feeling all these feels. And when I said, you're grieving, he's like, Oh, I had to label it or name it for him. And then it made all the sense to him that oh, yeah. all this sadness, all this longing was grief. So often we do have these feelings of sadness, longing, of despair, and we just don't know why. But it, if we can take that, you know, higher view of like what what what's lost, what have what are we missing? So people that have retired, people that have moved. I remember when I sold my house a couple of years ago. I'm still grieving that house I, just the times the love all that stuff that was in there and you know so that's part of my mission of why i do this because grief is not just losing a person it is situations and when people can understand that and give themselves permission of like yeah i'm i'm grieving and, and it can be more understood worldwide that it doesn't have that grief is not doesn't have to be just people. Yeah. I was just thinking about, as you were talking about that, Sue, I was thinking about um, how one time I got laid off. There's horrible grief in getting laid off because it's really not your choice at all. It's a terrible, uh, traumatic kind of, you know, mm-hmm. end of end of story experience. And um, I remember different stages of motherhood. Like when I knew that I had my last child and I wasn't going to have an infant again. And, you know, like there was just this, overwhelming at in some ways grief of an end of part of my life and i think that those a, a dream uh, i know when i when i got divorced one of the hardest parts of it was realizing the dream of having a nuclear family intact was over for me and that was like one of the hardest parts to process so you know it's really interesting like how many ways that we encounter loss and and 
and ones that are really painful to process, but we don't necessarily name them that way. Mm -hmm. And we don't, ex we don't talk about it as a grieving experience. Yeah. Uh, lots of, lots of grief through our parenting hood, right? Like yeah. if we, if we nurse our babies and that was the last time we ever knew, as they grow older, as they go off when they get married, um, personally, my, my children, my three adult kids, they're all, um, they all fall within the LGBTQ soup. And, mm -hmm. That was a certain amount of grief I had with all three of them, only because you don't think, like you have a certain fantasy when your kids are growing up, like this is how it's going to be. And then when it comes that it's different, which is absolutely fine, but there's a little bit of grief there just because yeah. the dream isn't the way you thought. Yeah, yeah. So when we encounter loss, oftentimes when we get when we might be have like had a whole bunch of these little losses along the way and not really known what to do with them not really process them and then when a big loss comes that's oftentimes when it all comes in doesn't it like it's all like a big glob in there and now i'm grieving like everything at once i mean i know that's been my experience well, sometimes. <laughs> that's why your yeah. podcast is so so important because our old wounds will show up in grief yeah. So if we are, if we have an old wound of there's no one, no one's ever there for me, we're going to bring that forward in our grief. And no one's ever here for me when I'm, when I need them. Is that actually the grief or is that actually the old wound speaking? Yeah. So it's really interesting when I'm talking with people and I see the old wound showing up. You know, that is not something I do in their first year. I just listen very compassionately. But if there is someone that is three, four, you know, maybe even two years, it depends how many times I've talked to them and I see an old wound showing up, you know, we have to start talking about that because they're not going to get far if that old wound is, they're just dragging around forever. Yeah, yeah. I always think of old wounds as like these imprints you know in our energy field and as soon as one gets touched now we're we're triggered and all kinds of reactive behavior and and we really lose our power that way we aren't mm -hmm. in full consciousness and able to really respond from the best place and all those things that we really want to be doing so um, that kind of work is uh, so important so important and i can imagine how much you must be in and out of that all the time with grief work yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah yeah. Now, how about we talk a little bit about holidays, too? Oh, go ahead, Laurel, and we'll come back to the holidays. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, I think that, you know, when when we suffer a loss and we are grieving, and we end up grieving something that has happened in the past, you know, it's the snowball of we've been carrying these old wounds, and in, in our grief, grief, they, you know, the old wounds come up, and we end up in this grief soup, right? Like, a lot of grief. I think that makes it especially hard for those people who want to be there for us and help us not understanding, you know, where our grief is coming from and the amount, you know, it, maybe it's that compounded grief over decades, but now all of a sudden we're grieving many things at one time. So I think that's really an important reminder to, to, you know, if you are grieving to be able to, um, just know that it might be bigger than what other people expect, and that's okay. Absolutely, absolutely. You can have a trauma when you're 16 that was never really healed, and and have a a, a loss, like say at our age, and that the loss has been talked out and listened to and, and validated, but you're still feeling this sadness and you're not understanding in it. And it may be that 16 year old that is like kind of raising their hand of like, but what about me? And it's just so confusing because you're not understanding, but it's that 16 year old because now it's feeling like, Hey, um, my turn. And, you know, this is when you need that help, that, that coach or that therapist to really help you work that out because 
there's all these different parts of us that are now coming forward. Yeah. And, and, and grief can do that. That's a great example too, Sue, because I feel like sometimes, um, especially as a parent, right, there are different stages that your kids, as they're going through them, sometimes those kinds of things get pinged, right? At different ages, you're like looking at your child and, you know, why am I feeling so sad when I'm looking at my child when they're 10, you know, and they're, they seem okay. They're fine. But why am I so sad all the time? Right? It could be something like that. Yeah. 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 I'll give you another example of how we hold it in our body. And this is a, a um, personal example. Yeah. So when my husband died, I had a frozen shoulder in my right side. And so this is eight years ago. So there was grief and there was pain physical pain at the same time. And now I have a frozen shoulder currently in my left side. And so there's pain, but I've been feeling really griefy lately. And I finally put the connection together of pain and grief. They kind of going together and it took, it took me a while, but I finally figured it out of like that shoulder pain is bringing up a lot of grief because it did eight years ago and, and it's connected. So we have these body, um, our body holds so much. And I see this as a massage therapist that our bodies hold emotions. So if you have a, an old wound, physical wound, they could be reactivated with grief or if something's acting up our body holds so much and i don't know if you know the book the body keeps the score yes but, yes <laughs> we've talked about it a lot on this podcast we have, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing yes. yeah. so i'm so glad you're bringing this up too because i remember um and and i know laurel can speak into this too being a yoga uh, instructor as well is I was as teaching Tai Chi and in my training of Tai Chi, I remember early on um, in doing the form. And one time I was up in front of class, I wasn't teaching, but I was demonstrating and we were moving through something. And all of a sudden I just felt literally like I could fall down and cry. I was like overcome. All I wanted to do was cry. And I thankfully I held it together. I don't really know how, quite frankly. But anyway, I got out to the car and I started sobbing. And I realized as I was sitting there, I was crying and I was like, what's going on? And I had and I didn't really know what it was, but what I felt was that I I had been moving energy in my body and I felt that I, in that moment I knew like when I was young, I was storing a lot of my sadness and grief. Like I was pushing it down as far down in my body as I could get it to keep it because my legs were the strongest part of my body. And I knew I was mo pushing it down there and it was suddenly starting to like be released mm -hmm. and come up through my body. And I know, you know, people talk about this, like going to yoga and they like, I love yoga, but sometimes I just start crying and I don't know why. And, you know, and I think that this is part of it, right? Is we, we do our, our body. We literally keep the energy of sadness or grief or whatever in, in the cells of our body. And as the energy starts to move and be released, we, here comes the, here comes the, the emotion, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. 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 It, it, and it's a beautiful thing because it's our body's way yeah, of saying, beautiful. okay, we need to release this. Let go, let go, let yeah. it go. Yeah. Yeah. I always feel like that's a, yeah. A home run. <laughs> it starts yeah. like, okay, let yeah. it go, let it go. <laughs> it's just, we fight it. You know, we sometimes yeah. we fight it because we don't know better. But I know. <laughs> I know. Like, I mean, I was a great example because I was up in front of that class, right? It would have been okay if I started crying. Nobody was good, would have done anything. I could have said, oh my gosh, I feel sad all of a sudden and just walked over. You know, I mean, it would have been fine, but not me. I would have been like, oh, I can't do that. I'd be so yeah. embarrassed, you know. And <laughs> Hello, ego. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then all that cultural conditioning, too. It's like, oh, what? Don't cry in front of people. It's not healthy or right or whatever it was. I don't know what it was. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about holidays as we're in the holiday season, because I do feel like that's often a time that um, can bring up more emotional stuff for all of us mm -hmm. even if you're not in a loss but you've had a loss or um or just are sentimental right you like we this is a time when we often tap into that so right. um yeah let's talk let's normalize that a little bit yeah mm -hmm. yeah the holidays 
definitely brings up the grief. There's an empty place at the table. There's loss. There's the traditions are missing a person. Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, let me, let me think what I want to say about that. Um, you know, often when the holidays come, our mindset can be, oh, they love the holidays so much, or they, they love Christmas morning so much. And while that is absolutely true, what is really happening, in my opinion, is that we are missing them, watching them love the morning of Christmas. We are missing them sitting there at the, and it's just honoring that grief, honoring that. Yeah, making some space for it. Making, I, yeah, yeah. And then in the midst of all the the holiday, you might actually experience a little joy, and then feel badly that you feel okay for a minute, right? That's even normal. So much, so much of that. Yeah. Yes, I was running a, um, a group last Thursday, and that was the whole topic of people feeling guilty about feeling happy, even the slightest bit, and. It, it's okay to feel two emotions at one time. Feeling happy does not take away the sadness and feeling sad does not take away happiness. We can feel yeah. both emotions. Yeah. And sometimes one can even stimulate the other. Sometimes you can feel sad and then you remember something about the person and then all of a sudden you feel happy or joyful because you're remembering mm -hmm. something good. Right. And you can have like happy can, tears. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. All, all normal and, and good and okay. Yeah. yeah. It's, you know, the trick is, is not to make your emotions wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, just the emotions are only the feedback of how much love there was, you know? Yeah. It's a, it reminds me of um, my, when my grandmother died and um, she was 99 and a half. And as I was speaking to, it was in an office setting and I was working full time somewhere and talking to, a couple people about my grandmother has just died and I'm going to take a couple of days off. But I was in this place where I was, you know, actually happy to be coming into a big family reunion, looking forward to the gathering and, and really her life. She had a very full life. And while it wasn't expected that she was, you know, her death was um, somewhat of a surprise from an Ill, a short term illness, but she was 99 and a half. And, a, and another woman said to me, how can you even be laughing at a time when your grandmother died? You know, and so it is that confusing piece of emotion. And it is sad, but there's so much joy over the course of a lifetime. You can feel both things at one time, um, within a minute of each other, probably. Right? Seconds. Seconds. Yeah. yeah, but it is confusing for some people who have not experienced maybe the duality of emotion or are uncomfortable or feel guilty or bad for not only having one emotion being the sadness or grief or loss. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And I do think that there are a lot of um, cultural um, misconceptions about grief and so they get translated into these messages like that how can you feel anything you know but sad at this moment and it's it's a unfortunate again another unfortunate way that people often respond in in those situations because it's okay to feel happy for a minute at a, at a celebration of somebody's life you know, yeah, of course, yeah, right, right. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's what we did with my, uh, my husband. We, we called it a celebration of life and we actually called it a fun rule <laughs> instead of a funeral. We called it a fun rule and we had a open mic for people to come up to roast them, whatever they wanted to do, because we wanted it to be, let's talk about them. Let's talk about how wonderful he was, what a pain in the butt he was, like all of it. And there was laughter, there was tears, there was all of it. Because that's, we were all of that. Each one of us were all of that. And we, yeah. there was just no shame in making fun of him. There was no, sh there was just no shame in any of our emotions. And I hope that 
your listeners understand that there's no shame in any of our emotions and you you can't do grief wrong we do it it's, it's just so individual absolutely absolutely and and uh i had a client um i just was with a client today who who was going through her first real loss of of life and a really significant one and you know i said you're learning how i mean the first time through you really you don't know you mm-hmm. it, it's like a whole like you like you woke up and you're in a different world and you don't know any of the rules or any of the things that you're supposed to do or any of the ways to get through it it's like you, you it is new territory of life yeah absolutely and it's yeah. and it's hard it is so yeah. hard going through it and it's the last yeah. thing you want to do yeah it's absolutely yeah. the last thing and and that's why i do this work because people need to be educated about grief because the time you get educated is the worst time. <laughs> I know it. I know it. Do you have a favorite book, Sue, that you recommend to people on the topic? Um, I like any of the books by David Kessler. Mm-hmm. And I'm just a big fan of him because he is the one I got trained by for being a certified educator. Um, but I also like Megan Devine. She is... Mm-hmm. She's very down to earth, and her book is it's, it's okay not to be okay. Mm, good, that's great. Yeah, okay. yeah. Good resources for people. Yeah, and I have plenty of resources on my website. Okay, all right. Some great. My, so you're- some, yeah, yeah, some of my favorite books, and there's some websites on there. There's um, the National Suicide website, and that's where you can fill out a form and get a conversation. Um, with someone like me that's a peer-to-peer, and it's just a free conversation with anybody across the United States that is a, um, that's a peer-to-peer counter conversationist. It's called the healing conversation. Because um, particularly with suicide, you just really want to talk to someone that has had that loss because it's so... Yeah. Very specific. Yeah. Very specific, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I certainly would be happy to talk to anybody also if anybody in your listeners wanted to get a hold of me because it's such a specific class and that is more my specialty. Yeah, that's great. That's great. So all your contact information will be here in the notes. Um, Laurel, any any more questions for Sue or anything coming up before we wrap up today with our, with our show? You know, you know, maybe one question might be, um, you know, in, in working – if someone identifies, one of our listeners or all of our listeners, our listeners identify that maybe working with a, a grief educator would be something that's good for them. Um, I guess how, Sue, so how might you, what could you tell us about how that work begins? Um, okay. Um, well, I'm also a, you know, grief coach, life coach, and we just really, I, I really just listen to them the first before we even work before we even work together to hear where they are because um, sometimes it's too early and they just need to heal a little bit so we just I just we just listen and if someone does want to move forward we, we we talk every every week or every other week and I give them tools it's mainly a lot of witnessing and sharing stories of how I did it, um, proven tactics that have worked for other people. Um, individual, yeah, I guess individual coaching is more specific for different losses. Mm-hmm. It's usually the group coaching that I offer because then healing, um, healing in a group and being witnessed by others is often more powerful. Yeah. I can imagine. Yeah. I, have, yeah, yeah, I think that, yeah, that group work is so powerful because I think it's, again, uh, sometimes we have fleeting thoughts or feelings or whatever, and somebody says it in a group and suddenly it seems normal or it's not something we might talk about, but somebody else is talking about it. Now it's, 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 it's something that I can address now that somebody else has brought it up, right? Like there's this whole circle it, of support. Yeah, and you just and don't feel so alone. Yeah. You start yeah. seeing other people that are like, oh, they're, they've they got you know, tremendous loss also. Because you feel so isolated in your, in your pain. 
I know, I know. Yeah. Pain is very lonely, very lonely experience. And yet, um, it just just as it is with so much of the beautiful work, you know, is it becomes more beautiful if you're not alone in it. And there are always resources out there. So it's a matter of finding your your connections and your right space to begin to do the work and um, feel feel comfortable uh, digging in and doing more, you know, mm -hmm. to get the work done. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, and I, 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 yeah. I was going to say just one last thought that, you know, this is such an area of um, where self-compassion is, is so important because often we judge ourselves for our own reaction to things. Right. And so for, you know, when you are suffering a loss that all of a sudden I might be judging myself that why, why am I feeling all this big feeling when it simply was, you know, a loss of a job or a loss of a pet. Um, so, and so I do think like there's room in this work, just the self-compassion of knowing it's okay to feel all your feelings and other people feel similarly, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's that no is right. such a yeah, yeah. such a big part of it because we are so hard on ourselves. Yeah. Um, I know I was. I was like, I should be over this. I should feel better. And, yeah. and just getting that, I don't know, almost permission of like, no, you've been traumatized. No, you don't need to be over this in three months. Right. And there is no getting over this. Yeah. It, it, and you know, yeah. there's just so much bad information out there. Oh, like the second year is going to be harder. And who says? I know. Who says right? that? You know, it's right. like yeah. th th there's yeah. no rule. <laughs> right. Right. That's right. There's, right. Yeah. There's no wrong way to do grief. I think is what you said, right. Sue. Yeah. yeah. There's yeah. no wrong. <laughs> there's absolutely no wrong way. Yeah. And right. that in itself is like, oh, thank goodness, <laughs> it's mm -hmm. your way. It's your yeah. way. But if you are lost, you know, reach out to me and I'll help yeah. you, you know, get on the path to the healing, mm -hmm. to, to that self healing. That's great. That's great. So good. Uh, thank you so much for spending time with us today and sharing with our listeners and uh, supporting uh, our, our folks out there who may be struggling, especially this season. And, uh, I'd love to have you come back again to talk some more, Sue, sometime. I'd love to. Yeah. I'd absolutely love good. to. Yeah. Thank you. Good. All right, listeners, all the contact information for Sue is in the show notes, uh, how you can get a hold of her, what she's got coming up for any groups in the future, those kinds of things will all be here in the show notes. So don't hesitate to read out, reach out to her. And uh, we'll be back for more beautiful work real soon. Thanks again, Sue. Thank you, Thank Laura. Bye, Sue. Bye, Laura. Bye. -bye. Bye.